We have 25 minutes left uh, in this uh, particular session. Um, and Michael, I, I, is this, are you giving me the cue that you have to depart? I have to catch an airplane. You have to catch an airplane. So, no, ladies and gentlemen, it's really the airplane. It's not symbolic that the UK member of the uh, member is leaving the panel. That, that's <laughs> that, that's not what it is. Not about the. Thank you very much. Very nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. Thank you, Michael. We won't. We won't. Uh, we won't uh, ov overestimate uh, and read into the symbolism of this particular act, but we wish you a, a safe uh, flight back. If you will, uh, you, you safe flight back, Michael. Uh, if you will, you can you can push up uh, uh, the seat that way. Uh, it probably looks gonna uh, looks looks a bit better on the picture, ladies and gentlemen. Now. Um, uh, I'm, I'm fairly certain that in the midst of uh, these very interesting and passionate presentations, there has been, uh, we ha we'll have an accumulation of some comments, uh, uh, remarks, and questions. If that's the case, please indicate so that we can uh, do a very <laughs> quick Q&A uh, session in the remainder of the time. If there are questions, please let me know by by indicating and I will incorporate you. If that's not the case at this particular point, I have a couple of questions on my own, Minister Borrell. Um, the issue of migration, uh, obviously, and it's become very clear throughout the presentations here on this panel, has led to a rise of populism uh, uh, and uh, populist parties throughout uh, EU national uh, parliaments. Spain, on the other hand, um, despite having gone through some hardship, economic hardship, uh, itself has been spared of this particular phenomenon. There is no significant populist movement in Spain to speak of. Why do you think the Spanish case is so different? Well, you uh, ne not pas that in Spain we have pas de mouvement populiste. Oui, on les a. On n'a pas de réactions xenophobes. On n'a pas de réactions anti-migrants. Mais il y a des populismes qui ne sont pas comme ça. Et ça, c'est une bonne question. Pourquoi est-ce que l'Espagne... D'abord, l'Espagne n'a pas reçu le, le nombre d'immigrants qui a reçu l'Italie. Les Italiens se sont sentis abandonnés par l'Union européenne. Ils ont demandé de l'aide. Nous, les Espagnols et les Français, ont regardé de l'autre côté. Tandis que nous, en Espagne, on n'a pas eu cette grande concentration comme on a eu en Italie, ou comme en Allemagne, il y a, il y a deux étés. Maintenant, ça commence. Maintenant, ça commence. On a déjà presque 40 000 arrivées de, pendant le, cette année. Mais eh, il y a, c'est vrai, au fond de la société espagnole, un sentiment de solidarité qui se montre tous les jours dans l'accueil des migrants dans le sud, en Andalousie. Peut-être parce que nous avons été un peuple de migrants. Peut-être parce que nous avons besoin d'une quantité de main d'œuvre. Peut-être parce que notre migration a été surtout latino-américaine et c'est beaucoup plus facile d'intégrer quelqu'un qui parle votre langue et qui partage une, une tradition culturelle, religieuse. C'est beaucoup plus facile, beaucoup plus facile d'intégrer des de gens de l'Amérique du Sud que des gens de, du camp de l'Afrique. Je pense que ça, ça jouait. Mais le, en Espagne, nous n'avons pas, croisons les doigts, cette réaction contre les migrants, cette réaction contre l'étranger, cette idée qui se développe dans l'Est de l'Europe de dire on veut être une société pure, on refuse la migration, on se ferme. Ils le disent clairement, on ne veut pas des migrants. Et on a vu le, le gros échec d'essayer d'attribuer des quotas obligatoires dans les pays de l'Est. Ça n'a pas marché. Et normalement, ça ne doit pas pouvoir marcher parce qu'on violente les désirs profonds d'une société. Je pense que ça, c'est la raison plus importante. J'espère que nous continuerons à être une terre d'accueil et nous continuerons à avoir avec nos voisins du nord de l'Afrique, le Maroc, une politique de coopération qui nous aide beaucoup. Thank you so much. The, the cooperation, obviously, when it comes to migration, is a very uh, important one. Now, um, Karin Kneisel, uh, your government, uh, particularly its junior partner, uh, has been uh, making statements that could be defined and interpreted as xenophobic and, and uh, uh, anti-refugee, anti-migrant issues. Now, uh, 
the criticism that, that your government and particularly your junior partner has received in the international sphere is widely known. Uh, would you say, when we talk about the future of Europe and, and Austria in particular, um, that that's, um, there's no danger as far as Austria drifting uh, to the right uh, on this particular front. Uh, do, you, do you think that the, the concerns that your government has been issuing and voicing vis-a-vis -vis refugees and migrants uh, are very much in place? Uh, could you be a bit more specific? Yeah. About your junior partner? No, no, about your criticism, because I don't understand your question. Yeah, well, well I mean, at, at this particular point, the, the, uh, the, the xenophobic sentiments uh, that your junior partner has uh, been... Can, can, can you give a particular example? Because I'm not aware of a, of a particular example. No. You're, you're not aware? No. Well, I'm, I'm German-speaking as well, so... Yeah. so no, no, but uh, to be more specific, because you're yeah. putting here a very general statement, but I would be very keen to have, for instance, the a kind of quotation or something, just to be more specific, so, so the that proposal, I can, so so proposal that I can for, respond in a specific way. Right, so the proposal, for instance, to have uh, people of uh, Jewish faith to, to register, uh, is that something no, that, that, sorry, that this, in the this, news? This, no, this, uh, sorry, that's, that's really, that's that, not, I mean, so you're that's taking, fake news? Is that, is that no, fake I'm, news? I'm not saying this is fake news, but this is something where you're not taking out something that was decided under a previous government in a specific province when it comes to distribution about uh, ordering a certain type of food. And this has been something that was decided in a province by a previous government. So not by the current government and not, we were not speaking about the national government, you were speaking about the regional government. Well, then let's put it very bluntly and clear yeah. and, and uh, you, you know, with a very simple yes or no answer. You're saying the government, the Austrian government, is not drifting towards the right. Is, is that what you're saying? It's not. Yeah, well, well, your your your, your uh, question was xenophobia. Mm. So please give me a very specific example about the national government where anybody of us, among the ministers, Chancellor Eisler, as the Minister of Foreign Affairs, because I'm sitting here, right. I'm in charge of foreign affairs. Can you please give me a very specific example where, for instance, I have been pronouncing myself as a xenophobic? Right. Please. Well, the, the, the accusation, or rather the, the statement, is obviously not directed towards you personally or, or your particular party. But, uh, but on the government. Please, 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 please. Yeah, but give me an exam a specific yeah. example. I can give you a specific answer. Okay, well, obviously I, I don't have the, the, the statements now from your junior yeah, partner. Yeah, but, but you're yeah. making now statements, and I would right. like, I, I don't like this kind of, you know, just putting accusations into the room. So if you're specific, I'll give you a specific answer. Right. So, so th then let's broaden it up, because obviously at this particular point, uh, uh, you're not comfortable or, or... No, it's not about comfortable, about it's about... I would like to join here, this conference is called World Policy Conference, right. I would like to be specific on global issues. Right. So. But, but of course the topic that we're discussing here are about some basic strategic yes. European so if issues. You, the, the, the more you become specific, right. the more I can be also... And I don't like this kind of, you know, just general uh, fluffy statement. Well, let's, so. let's talk about the, ba uh, the specific goals then of Austrian EU presidency. Let, let, let's talk about uh, what, uh, what Austria is, is, is in the midst of contributing uh, to a sound, uh, safe and prosperous EU. How, how about that? Yes, with Lila can answer on that. Well, wonderful. We, we, <laughs> we have come to an agreement. Yes, thank you very much. A specific question, a specific answer. Uh, we are now in the third, fourth month of uh, the EU presidency and uh, what I, as Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, try in particular, and I've briefly referred to it when it comes to Southeast Europe, I've spoken about the vacuum uh, that we have in Southeast Europe, and where I think that, um, I mean, we, we feel close. Geography is the constant factor of history, as we know. We have uh, a large diaspora of people with Serbian, Kosovo, Albanian, whatever origin, and we have. Um, we, we have an absence of perspective, in particular for the young population there. And my first visits all went to Sarajevo, to Belgrade, to Zagreb, because it's a, it's a region that we know about its importance, being surrounded by EU countries and not having the clear-cut perspective versus uh, a European future. So I fully understand the skepticism, and it was uh, uh, my uh, deputy Boulanger also referred to the European elections, in Paris, in The Hague, uh, whenever you speak about enlargement in that part of the world, you of course have a separate... Je, je trouve qu'il y, y a quelque chose qui doit être relativisé. Simplement, la grand, je terminerai par là. La grande différence entre les Français et les Allemands sur l'Europe, c'est la suivante. C'est qu'en France, vous ne trouverez personne qui soit d'accord avec le statu quo européen. 
vous aurez soit des gens qui sont contre, qui veulent revenir en arrière, soit des gens qui veulent aller plus loin. En Allemagne, ils sont très contents de l'Europe telle qu'elle est, et ils disent si ça ne marche pas mieux, c'est parce que les gens ne respectent pas les traités tels qu'ils sont. Mmh. Donc là, il y a une différence d'approche qui est sensible, et ça explique un peu de la déconvenue que vous prêtez au, au président Macron, parce qu'il est arrivé avec l'idée de dire oh « ben, la France a traîné les pieds, l'Allemagne a toujours voulu aller de l'avant », eh bien non la France traînait les pieds, mais l'Allemagne est, depuis Maastricht, depuis la réunification, satisfaite de l'Europe telle qu'elle est. Mais maintenant, l'Europe est menacée et il va falloir partir de l'avant. Merci beaucoup. Clairement, unlike le état de l'Europe, les problèmes techniques ici are somewhat going through a, a rough time, but I think we're back now, uh, we're back. Uh, the, the time clock here has vanished, perhaps we can put that up as well so I can uh, keep track because I know we are uh, running out of time. Uh, uh, Nicolas, uh, you're both based uh, in Europe and the US, uh, so you have a, a double perspective, if you will, uh, on issues. Uh, now, the, the current US president obviously has m made no secret about it that perhaps he doesn't, uh, you know, issues and, and, and relations with Europe are not his number one uh, pr uh, priority. Is the relevance of the EU diminishing from where you're standing when you're in uh, DC and speaking uh, to your American counterparts? Is that what you're encountering, that Europe is, is losing in terms of influence and relevance in that part of the world? I think there are different time cycles and different issues here. In terms of the fact that Europe is not central in how the US looks at the world, this has been a long-standing trend. You remember when President Obama was uh, nicknamed the Pacific presidency, uh, that he, wasn't, he didn't have a background in Europe, he wasn't interested in Europe. So uh, nothing very new here. Clearly the US sees the major security issues uh, in the Middle East and in China. Uh, the, the, the European Union has been seen as low priority simply because it was not a hotspot of problems. Uh, and uh, that's not the Trump presidency. I think the, the question, which is still unresolved, like so many questions about the Trump presidency, is whether uh, this administration will be ag aggressively hostile to Europe. Because what President Trump has said, that you know, the European Union was uh, set up to take advantage of the US, and to put the US in a difficult position, uh, that is unprecedented. This is something that no previous president has mm -hmm. said. So I wouldn't frame it in terms of relevance, irrelevance. I would frame it in terms of, is the US going to be aggressive against European um, integration, or is it just a, a flutter and something that will go away? Mm -hmm. I think we don't know yet. It's, uh, I would say that Europe is actually more relevant in a way because uh, it is more of a counterway to some impulses of the Trump administration, certainly in trade or in climate change. It's less aligned with the uh, American administration than it was in a previous, uh, certainly under the Obama administration. So that creates conflict and conflict creates relevance. Uh, but we're not, uh, we're, we're, it's, it's basically too early to tell. Minister Knaisel, we're almost uh, out of time, but I do want to get a sense because uh, um, when we talk about Europe, and this particular panel has been no exception, of course, the need uh, for solidarity has al is always being uh, stressed. Uh, if, if you look at the future uh, and talking to your European counterparts, such as uh, Minister Borrell, what is your sense, uh, since we're uh, slowly winding down here, how optimistic are you about the state of the European Union, about the role of the European Union going forward and its relevance in, in world affairs? Well, what I have always been proud of as a European citizen is that it is built on treaties. And just a few days ago, 24th of October, we had the signing uh, 370 years ago of the Treaty of Westphalia, which was, in my uh, assessment, the beginning of modernity in Europe because it was the beginning of the territorial state, it was the beginning of the equality of the sovereigns and also of international law. So everything we have seen in terms of evolving, also of multilateralism, but Grotius, Richelieu, uh, an idealist and a realist, uh, the, uh, the two of them who had been drafting to a certain extent the Treaty of Westphalia, and later, much later. Uh, that, is, uh, that for me is what Europe is about, normative basis and credibility. And here I think in order to remain credible, 
in particular with regard to China, it's all about are we complying with our own normative obligations. And this leads uh, to what has been stated also when it comes to currency affairs. This has this, uh, in my opinion right now, in foreign affairs is a lot about uh, the Iran nuclear uh, disarmament treaty, the JCPOA. Uh, a phrase that all of us have studied once upon a time when going into national relations is pacta sunt savanda. Treaties have to be preserved. The trust, in the end, it's all about the trust and signatures that we have. And I think this is what Europe has always been standing for. So in order to remain credible, to be considered a player, we have to fulfill our own uh, obligations on a normative level. And uh, here, uh, going far beyond solidarity, uh, because solidarity is a nice catchword, but you have to enshrine it into norms. And um, I would like to see, um, I repeat myself, a Europe moving out of this mentality of bean counting, the Kremer Seelen that we have, the Budenbrocks that we have uh, here and there, and uh, going more into understanding the, the bigger geopolitical challenges. And this I miss on many levels. Uh, and for that, it's a level of uh, humanistic education that sometimes you have, uh, backbone, and, uh, and, a high, and a certain degree of courage and self-confidence. So he, that's how I understand my work as in my current position as EU chair. Uh, to, from time to time, it's necessary to call a spade a spade. Mm, a courage uh, for, uh, uh, or, or rather the desire for a more courageous and self-confident uh, Europe going forward. We're going to end this panel the way we started, uh, Minister Borrell. Uh, I want to give you the opportunity to, to uh, wrap up uh, this particular session with the very same question, of course. Uh, namely, looking forward about the future of the European Union, a union that your country has been a part of for, for many decades. Um, you're also somebody in your role, you, 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 you uh, travel all over the world, you talk to people. Uh, what is the assessment, the international assessment uh, uh, of uh, Europe? Do we still have the means, do we still have the influence to be a relevant player in world affairs? Not as much as needed. You know, um, before the Euro crisis, when I was traveling by South America, people asked me, you are a success story. Tell us how we should do in order to repeat your integration process. It was before the crisis, we were economically booming, absorbing a lot of migrants, and being something that people were looking at us as something to be followed, to be imitated. Then the crisis came, and uh, I think we have lost 10 years for many European countries. And today, we don't make the weight in front of the big, big powers that are emerging. No? I think the future of Europe passes through a bigger integration, a stronger integration, but not all of the member states are ready to do so. Many of them, they are not willing, not just the United Kingdom, who has living, who is living. Other countries don't want to integrate better. Germany, it's at their optimum. It's in a situation where it's very good, the situation he has. Why should Germany change? You know? But if you want to have a role in the world, if you want to influence the global world, then even Germany alone is too small. We have to integrate better and more, but knowing realistically that this is not going, there is not the will for doing that in many European countries. Mm. So the key word for me is differentiated integration around the Eurozone and the Schengen Zone. So two-track Europe? Is that we are already on two-track Europe. Mm. Some member states share currency, others don't share. Some member states has abolished their borders, others they are very much stick to their borders and they want to close them. Uh, two of the m most important characteristics of a state, the currency and the border, some of us, we are sharing it, and others, we refuse to share it. So the, the differentiated integration is there. It's nothing new. Mm -hmm. is, is this, because I'm trying to end on a hopeful and optimistic note here, but, but I understand and appreciate your honesty, of course, 
uh, about the concerns that you have vis-à-vis uh, uh, -vis Europe, uh, particularly with, as you've said, and I quote you, some, some member states are not uh, ready, willing uh, to, to uh, move this union along. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, some basic European strategic issues. Obviously, this is a topic that we could have gone on for the next two, three hours, a topic that will be with us for a very long time, because I think that much has become clear throughout the very passionate and eloquent statements here. Um, Europe will have a place and will have a role to play in world affairs, uh, whether it would like to or not. The question is, of course, in what scope, size, and capacity. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Julia Porel, Karin Kneissel, Michael Lothier, Nicolas Veron, and Jean-Louis Bourlange, please join me in thanking them. Thank you so much. Thank you.